Coming up on Doctype, does your website make people say, huh? We'll clear up some of the confusion with call to action buttons. Then, have you ever wondered, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? The HTML5 Geolocation API can help. Get ready because this shit is about to get real. It's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Colab Orlando and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that thinks JavaScript is a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. All right, so we have a lot of stuff to talk about today, so we're just gonna get right into it. I'm gonna tell you about call to action buttons, and then Jim is gonna tell you about the geolocation API in HTML5. Let's check it out. If you're trying to sell a product or service, chances are your website has a few call to action buttons. Optimizing these buttons can dramatically impact the success of your site. There's two major mistakes that people make with call to action buttons. The first mistake is people often neglect to have a call to action button at all. You'll arrive at their marketing site and there won't be anything to click on to move the user forward. Giving the user something to do next is an essential part of marketing a product or service successfully. For example, if you're selling a piece of entertainment like a movie or a video game, there should be a logical progression of steps. Chances are there will be a large video on the page with a movie trailer or a video game trailer. If people watch that and are excited about what they've seen, they might want to buy movie tickets or pre-order the game. There should be a prominent button close to the video that allows them to do just that. The other mistake people make is that they have too many call to action buttons. It's okay for a page to have multiple goals, such as getting users to sign up for a newsletter, follow you on Twitter, etc. However, if all these buttons look the same as the primary action, like buying a product, it can be very confusing to the user and it will dilute the success of your primary goal. In last week's episode, we talked about contrast. This is especially applicable to call to action buttons. Typically when people say contrast, they're talking about a difference in brightness and darkness. However, there are other types of contrast too. You can contrast two elements using different sizes, shapes, colors, and textures. These are all great ways to make your call to action buttons stand out. For example, on the homepage of Amazon.com, there's quite a bit of clutter because they're trying to cater to a lot of different customer needs all at once. However, they also want to sell their e-reader device, the Kindle. In order to contrast the Kindle with all the clutter around it, they've done two things. First, they've added a lot of white space or negative space around the device. This creates an oasis of calm amidst a very chaotic page. Secondly, they've made the Kindle enormous in comparison to everything else on the page. This contrast of negative space and contrast of size is enough to create a focal point on the page and draw a potential buyer's attention. One of the most important things to keep in mind when creating call to action buttons is to engage the users with copy. Call to action buttons should revolve around an action. Usually a call to action button says something like sign up or add to cart or learn more. The thing that all of these buttons have in common is that they're actions. In other words, the copy on your button should always start with a verb. For example, if a button said something like more about this product, it's not really asking the user to do anything. Using the right words on your call to action button can have a dramatic impact. To figure out what the best words are to use, you should run A-B tests. One way to test one design over another is to use the Google Website Optimizer tool, which allows you to auto-rotate designs and track which ones perform best. 37signals uses to great effect on their sign-up page for HiRISE, where they tested several different pieces of copy and ended up improving conversions by 30%. That wraps it up for call to action buttons, but when we come back, Jim is going to teach you a thing or two about the geolocation API. If you're in Orlando and you're watching this show, you need to be at Colab Orlando. Located in the heart of downtown, Colab Orlando has become a magnet for creative thinkers and entrepreneurs like you and me. If you're just stopping by for the day, or if you're starting the next big thing, Colab has you covered. With affordable office space, high-speed internet, and a great environment built for collaboration, Colab is the best place to co-work. Even we work there now. 
And if you're not in Orlando, be sure to check out the new Colab space that just opened up in downtown Nashville. If you want to become a member of Colab, or if you're just curious, be sure to check them out at colabusa.com. One of the new features in HTML5 is the Geolocation API, which allows you to request the user's location information to create more customized and localized experiences. In last week's episode, we looked at how to get a map onto our page using the Google Maps API. But wouldn't it be nice if we could use the user's location to create a more customized experience? Let's take a look at some code to make that happen. First, we need to take into account that geolocation is not available in all browsers. Right now, there is support in Chrome, Firefox, and Mobile Safari, and Android. To test if geolocation is available, we can test if navigator.geolocation exists. If you are using Modernizer to detect features, you can check for modernizer.geolocation. Next, we call navigator.geolocation.getCurrentPosition. We pass to it a callback function that will be executed when the user allows us to see their location and the location has been calculated. Now let's write our has position callback. Get current position will pass us a position object, which has a coordinates object in position.cords. That object is guaranteed to have latitude, longitude, accuracy, and the position object will also have a timestamp. Optionally, based on the user's computer, you might get altitude information, the altitude accuracy, as well as heading and speed. Now the user may have declined to give us their location information, or some other error may have occurred. In these cases, we should handle the errors gracefully. When we call navigator.geolocation.getCurrentPosition, we should pass a second function for handling errors. Our error handling callback will be passed an error object with a code attribute that's a number. If the error code is 1, that means the user declined to give you their location information. Since geolocation information is a very private piece of information, you should respect their decision and provide them with some other means of completing your task. If the error code is 2, that means they could not find the position. If error code is 3, that means there was a timeout, and any other errors will result in error code 0. Now what you do with the geolocation information varies from application to application, but very often it involves placing some information on a Google Map. Let's take a look at how to place a pin on the user's current location using the Google Maps API. So if we already have our map set up from the last episode on Google Maps, we can create the following geolocation callback. First, we create a lat long point using the position coordinates received from the get current position call, and we create a marker by calling new google.maps.latlong and passing that point to our position attribute. We also define which map we want to place the marker on, as well as a title to indicate to the user what that pin represents. And those are the basics of the geolocation API. With it, you can create experiences that show the user places and other people around them and much, much more. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you going to go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctite.tv from? So, we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you going to use? Enter the code DOCTYPE3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's it for this week until next time be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe via itunes or rss you'll never miss an episode of doctype so why not so until next tuesday remember that every great web page starts with doctype